Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are in such a bright room, so I'd like to bring some good news to the world. We know that since the 2008 global financial crisis, the world has not recovered to its growth potential, especially in high-income country. According to IMF forecast, U.S. growth in 2017 will be 2.2 percent, and uh, eurozone area will be 1.5 percent. Japan, 0.6 percent. High-income country used to grow at 3 to 3.5 percent. So we are far away from full recovery yet. However, there's one way to get full recovery in high-income country and certainly also in the world. That is global infrastructure initiative. Why it is so important for the fully recover in the world because we know when a country was hit by financial crisis, for the country to have a full recovery, they need to carry out structural reforms. Structural reform is good for the long-term full steam growth, but the implementation of structural reform in the short run is contractionary. It's going to reduce the growth is going to increase unemployment. And that's the reason why everyone knows structural reform is so important for the growth to return to normal. But politically, it is very hard. And in the past, when a developing country was hit by financial crisis, they will go to IMF for rescue. And I am able to advise the developing country, on the one hand, to carry out structural reform, and with the understanding structural reform in the short run was contractionary, IMF would advise the country to devalue the currency in order to increase export, use the job created by export to create a space for the structural reform. But this time, this formula will not work because all the high-income countries were hit by the financial crisis simultaneously. And they are on the same level of development. Their products were competitive in the global market. So if any country wants to use devaluation as a way to create a space for their domestic structural reform is going to trigger the competitive devaluation. In fact, that was what we observed in the past eight years. So we need to find some kind of innovative way that can increase the high-income country export in order to create jobs, to create a space for the structural reform. And infrastructure investment is the way to do it. Certainly, you can do the infrastructure domestically to create job and demand, but in a high-income country, because overall infrastructure is ready, at most old, and another kind of situation, if you only do infrastructure investment domestically, there's a constraint that is so-called Ricardian equivalence. So you need to find a way the infrastructure investment to overcome the Ricardian equivalence. That is, we need to find some kind of bottleneck religion infrastructure. That kind of investment in a short run, create a demand, create a job, in the long run can enhance the productivity because you release the bottleneck of growth. And so that kind of productivity enhancing type of bottleneck religion infrastructure can use the future growth, future revenue to pay back 
the expenditure of infrastructure currently. And high-income country, as I mentioned, because infrastructure basically ready, they may be old, but if you try to do infrastructure on those type of investment, it's something like digging a hole, paving a hole, the productivity enhancement is not high enough to cover its cost. But there's opportunity. Because in the developing country, there are so many infrastructure bottlenecks almost everywhere, even including China. And the need for infrastructure investment in a developing country is so large. According to Asian Development Bank estimate, in Asia alone, each year there's a need for 800 billion US dollars of infrastructure. In Africa, each year there's a need for 930 billion US dollars of infrastructure investment. Globally, in the developing world, there's a shortage of 500 billion US dollars of infrastructure investment fund. So if we can find a way to mobilize resources to invest in this kind of infrastructure, according to World Bank research, every dollar's investment in the developing world will create 70 cents of import to the developing country. And among them, half will come from the high-income country. So that means that if we have a sufficient large amount of infrastructure investment in the developing world, and uh, they will create a demand for export from high income country, it will have the same function as the devaluation of the currency to increase export. And so it can create a space for the structural reform. Carol <clears throat> is here. I started to promote this idea in February 2009, when I was at the World Bank and I gave a speech at the Peterson Institute. And I'm delighted to report this idea has been increasingly entertained. Like Larry Summers also support these ideas, like Paul Krugman also support these ideas, IMF in the October issue of 2014 also support these ideas, and in recent G20 meeting in Hangzhou, this idea has also been supported. But we need to have leadership. And the leadership from the US is extremely important. Although this idea now has been recognized as a way out for the global economy to have a full recovery, but in the past, because of political issue in the US, this idea is not being endorsed. But now we have a president elected, Trump. He understands the importance of infrastructure. But I hope US will play the leadership role in the world to endorse the Global Infrastructure Initiative jointly with China. And you know that China has been keen on this. So China you know, proposed to set up Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and also the one bill, one role to promote the infrastructure connectivity in the world. So if US and China can join hand, then we are going to have a good news for the world. We can have a fully recovery from 2008 crisis. We don't have to go through lost decades in Japan encountered in the past 25 years. Thank you. President Orlin for this uh, wonderful um, uh, opportunity to learn about China's economy in, the 2000, in 2017. I have a question that Professor Lin, you mentioned uh, President-elect Donald Trump is paying attention to infrastructure investment. Um, we also know that there's another important strand of his uh, economic uh, policy, let's just say, is that um, he is very much against globalization. And uh, there, I just wonder um, what your, uh, if you can comment on how this kind of orientation um, uh, might have uh, on the uh, uh, further uh, uh, growth of global economic um, integration, you know, where 
that you mentioned that would uh, uh, re help to revive uh, global growth. Thank you. Good question. I think that Donald Trump is respectable. He wants to make America great again. And uh, to make America great again, America needs to return its normal growth of 3% to 3.5%. And as I mentioned, if you only look the sources for growth domestically, it will be very hard to create a space for the structural reform, and you are going to endure a long period of new normal or secular stagnation with that America cannot be great again. And so he is a person who really embraced the idea of to make America great again, then my proposal would be entertained by him. If he's really interested in making America great again. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. Good morning. Lyric Hughes Hale from Chicago. My question is, um, I think no one doubts the, the wisdom of infrastructure investment. But how will this square with the new regulations in terms of capital outflows from China? And will that affect China's infrastructure investment around the world or not? Thank you. Um, I did not get your question fully, so I'm, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question again? Yeah. Um, my question, can you hear now? Yeah. Okay. Um, capital controls yeah. from China, how yeah. will that affect China's infrastructure investment, not just in the United States, but around the world? Do you foresee that having an effect, and how could that affect global growth? Thank you. Well, China, the stability of growth in China is essential for China and for the world. Because we know, since the global financial crisis, China each year contributed more than 30% of the global growth. And uh, according to the IMS studies, when the high-income country have their monetary policy to affect the capital flow in the developing world, then it will be desirable for the developing country to have a capital account management. And that's what the Chinese government is doing, try to have a capital account management in order to maintain the stability of the growth in China. And as I mentioned, the stability of growth in China would be essential for the global growth. Okay. I'm Leni Rubinstein from the Executive Intelligence Review. I was very excited to hear um, you talk, Mr. Lin, because um, now we have a situation with the new President Trump. And he said 14 days before the election, he called for the introduction of Glass-Steagall again, of a separation between commercial and investment banks. So how do you think that uh, China would welcome a reintroduction of the Glass-Steagall um, Act in, uh, for uh, the purpose of infrastructure development? I don't. The, the, I, I, I beg your pardon, so I did not, the, uh, I did not get a question, yeah. Huh? The, the, the Glass-Steagall, uh, uh, that was what Roosevelt introduced in 1933, uh, where he separated commercial banking from investment uh, banking. Oh, okay. okay. I think that um, for the infrastructure investment, we need to have a special kind of financial arrangement. So in general, we know that infrastructure investment it's a long-term investment. And also, its return in the short run is not that high. And because of, it also needs a big, chunky investment to begin with. So its risk to the commercial bank is high. And in that kind of situation, we need to have a partnership bank. For example, China has China Development Banks specializing in providing infrastructure funding and also we have a global multilateral development institution like the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, and now newly established Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, New Development Banks, 
they can all they can all provide funding to support the financial uh, infrastructure investment. And this kind of idea has been endorsed by the G20 meeting in Hangzhou. So now they are going to set up global infrastructure hubs, global infrastructure connectivity initiative. And also that in the past, the sovereign wealth fund invests in US treasury or in the stock market in the US. And also pension fund invested in the treasury bill or the stock markets. But we know that the return to the treasury bill is so long. And the stock market certainly, you know, there are some risk there. And so if we can create some kind of new class asset to give some kind of seniority to the private source fund, including the sovereign wealth fund or pension fund, I'm sure we can mobilize enough resources to meet the gap of 500 billion US dollars infrastructure investment fund gap. And with that, as I mentioned, it will create the export to the high-income country, create a space for the structural in reform in the high-income country. So I think that as long as we have the will, we can find a way to achieve the goal. Okay, yeah. I think uh, it's now uh, time uh, uh, for the next session. Let's uh, uh, join me to thank Professor Lin again. Yeah.